Hello everyone, hope you can all hear, hear me. Um, my name is Riley and I'll be hosting this technical webinar for you today. I uh, hope you're all well. Before we get started, I'd just like to um, just to go over these notifications and sounds. So before we before we start presenting, um, can you please go to your notifications? So go to your settings, which should be in the bottom right hand corner of your screen if you're on desktop. Um, otherwise, uh, you might need to open the session menu or the hamburger bar on um, if you're on mobile. But if you just go to your notification settings, open up that drop down box as as you can see on the screen here and just untick all of those boxes underneath notification settings. That will just make sure you don't receive any pop-ups or sounds or notifications um, in the session, which can be disturbing while you're trying to watch. Okay, so um, today's technical topic um, is introduction to low voltage protective devices. Um, and this webinar is being presented by Alex Gregory, um, who's a, a lecturer with us at EIT, and she's also a senior um, electrical engineer working over in Brisbane. And I'll introduce her shortly. Um, just some common questions. So um, everyone that is registered for this webinar and those who are in the session right now will receive a copy of the PDF slides and a link to the video recording via email, and I'll send that out likely tomorrow. Um, we do also provide a free digital certificate of attendance for our um, technical webinar. Request a certificate, you can do so um, via the link that I'll provide at the end of the webinar. Um, so at the end of the webinar, I'll provide a short um, a link to a, um, a short form that you need to fill out and then you can receive a certificate and I will also send those um, tomorrow. Okay, so briefly about EIT. Um, so we are an engineering specialist education provider. Um, we have uh, a range of courses only in engineering, um, starting from uh, short courses that we call professional certificate of competency courses. Um, we have diplomas and advanced diplomas in the vet sector. In um, the higher education space, we have undergraduate and graduate certificates, uh, bachelor's and master's degrees, uh, bachelor's and, um, sorry, and a doctor of engineering. Um, now, all of those courses, um, we only specialize in engineering, um, so which, which makes us um, a preferred uh, provider and makes us quite unique. Um, our programs are regularly uh, updated to stay, um, to stay relevant with the industry. Um, so we, we try to ensure that through um, the updates to our courses that um, our students are graduating with the best outcomes possible. Um, we have uh, our vocational uh, programs and higher education degrees registered and accredited by the Australian government. Um, however, we do have programs that are internationally recognised under the three um, international engineering accords, so the Sydney, the Dublin and the Washington Accord. We do have courses that fall under those accords if you're interested. We have industry experienced lecturers, um, so not only those who are just uh, involved in academia, but um, uh, such as the presenter uh, today, um, Alex, she's uh, um, working full time in industry, um, but she also lectures uh, with uh, us at EIT. Um, so uh, we think that makes a pretty valuable um, learning experience for the students because um, our students can learn from lecturers who who actually have real world experience um, and can apply their teaching to, uh, to real world scenarios. So, and we have a um, unique delivery model. Um, so that includes live and interactive webinars such as the one you're in today. However, um, there's 250 um, of you in this webinar so far. Um, however, our class sizes are not that big. We're um, a rel relatively small provider. Um, so our webinars uh, are a lot more interactive if you're uh, if you're in one of our courses as we um, support small class sizes. We have dedicated learning support um, for all of our students. And we also have state-of-the-art technologies such as hands-on workshops, remote laboratories, and simulation software. 
Okay, um, I'll hand over now to Alex, who will be presenting this webinar and is a lecturer with us at EIT, as I mentioned. Um, so thank you very much, Alex, and I'll, um, I'll hand over to you now. No worries. All right, welcome everybody to today's lecture. So the topic of today is protective devices. Uh, in particular, we're going to run through just an overview of what LV protective devices you would see in an installation, um, some type of faults that you would experience and how those devices operate under faults. Uh, we'll look at some characteristics and operation of those protective devices. And then lastly, we're going to wrap up to look at some typical ratings and types uh, for both breakers and fuses. Uh, and hopefully at the end, we've got some time for Q&A. All right, so what is a protective device? So when we're talking circuit protection, under a normal operation, you've got normal voltage and normal current. However, during a fault condition, you have an extremely high fault current flowing. And what your circuit protection does is it kicks in to stop that high fault current from flowing through your system in order to prevent further damage to your equipment. So during that electrical fault, your power network suffers a lot of stress. When we have high current, we have a lot of heat and we have a lot of stress on our network. And this not only can permanently damage your network, but we want to limit the amount of time that you are exposed to that fault in order to get your systems back up and running as soon as we can. So by having protective devices that are appropriately rated, we're able to restore our system back to this normal working condition as soon as we can. So specifically what we're going to talk about today is the most common types. The first of all is circuit breakers, and there's a few types that we'll go through. And then the second is fuses. So we're just gonna do a quick poll here to see if I say the acronym MCB. So let me just write that up here. Just a very quick yes or no. Does anyone know what MCB stands for? So let me just set this up. If you jump into that poll online, hopefully this works. MCB stands. I'm not sure if that did what it was meant to do. Yep. Um, so it looks like it's working and I can cool. I can show the responses as well. So if I click that button, everyone should see those responses as well. So yeah. Amazing. Okay. So we'll close that and have a look at what responses we get. Um, so we have at least 70 of you saying yes. Uh, those of you who thought it was a miniature circuit breaker, you are correct. For those of you who thought it was perhaps a molded case circuit breaker, you are almost correct. So let's look at a few different types. When we're talking about a circuit breaker, so this is what automatically operates when you have a fault current. Now it's a particular current either in a short time, which is a very high current, or in a long overload scenario that will cause that circuit breaker to trip. So the two types you often will hear phrases are is overcurrent, which is when it's overloaded, and short circuit, which is when you've got a fault. Now, a couple of different types. MCB, as we polled, is what's known as a miniature circuit breaker. So they tend to supply your very small, low voltage loads, You know, typically up to about 63 amps. You then have your molded case circuit breaker. Now these tend to supply bigger loads, so anywhere from 100 amp up to say 800 amps. And when you're getting into your bigger installations, you have an air circuit breaker. And these are physically bigger and also can handle a lot more current. Now there's other different protective devices that you can install in high voltage installations, such as vacuum circuit breakers, um, and relays, but we're not going to be going into those just today. We're going to be focusing on these LV types. So the other type other than circuit breaker is fuses. Now, a type of low resistance conductor is what a fuse essentially is. 
and a fuse, unlike a circuit breaker, is sacrificial. So what we mean by that is when a fuse operates, it can only be used once. So it sacrifices itself when you hear the phrase, a fuse has blown. And by doing that, that's what it's doing to provide that overcurrent or that fault protection in your circuit. So fuses are an essential component and they've got a metal wire or a strip and it's when a certain current causes that, wetter, uh, that metal wire or strip to melt that essentially breaks your circuit and stops your current from flowing. So we've got a couple of different types that you might see around. Um, the most common is your ceramic type. You can get sacrificial or you, or you can get rewirable. They're just not as common anymore. Now HRC, these are what's known as a high rupturing capacity fuse. And essentially your fuse wire carries your short circuit for a period of time. Unlike these ceramic ones, HRC is often made of glass um, or some other type of chemical compound. They're also common in HV installations as well as LV. They're extremely reliable and they also don't deteriorate with age. The last one is not so much that I tend to use day to day, but these are the types of fuses that you see in 12 volt installations. So there'll be a lot of these installed within your car. Um, that's the most common area or anywhere else you've got 12 volt DC around the place. But the concept is the same. There's still that sacrificial wire between your two electrodes that when you have a very high current will melt and break your circuit. So when we're talking about uh, protective devices. Another quick poll question is the purpose of the circuit breaker. So does a circuit breaker protect equipment downstream or does it protect the cable downstream? So I'll just prep this for you and if you jump in there and let us know your answer and we'll see what falls out. So it looks like most people so far are thinking that it provides protection for the cable. Versus, all right, almost neck and neck. I'll give it a little bit more. So it's about 50-50 for those of you who have polled. Now, the answer is actually the cable. So in this diagram here, this is your protective device, this is your cable, and this would be your switchboard, or it could be a motor, or it could be something else that it's supplying. So this device is actually there to provide protection for your conductor during an overload. Now it might inherently provide protection for this switchboard, but that switchboard typically will have its own protective device, whereas this cable does not. So if this was to get damaged, whether it was through construction or through insulation failure, this is the circuit breaker that would trip. Now, if we look over at this picture here, it's just showing you what. So again, if we've got device one here with cable A and device two with cable B, device one is providing the protection to cable A. And device two, is providing protection to cable B. Now moving on to some types of faults. The faults that you might experience in an electrical network most commonly is either going to be a short circuit or a overcurrent or an overload fault. The only difference between these two is the amount of time it takes for that fault to occur. A short circuit is very quick, it's an immediate fault, whilst an overload can occur over a long duration. The other two types of faults that you most commonly see are over voltage or under voltage. So in this picture here, what it's just showing you graphically is if this black line was your normal voltage, if your voltage waveform was to reduce, you might get an under voltage fault, depending how much that voltage reduced by. This would show you that you have an over voltage situation. Whereas these two spikes here show that you might just have voltage spikes or transient issues in your network. 
So the concept is in a normal and safe operating condition, your equipment operates at normal voltage and at normal current. If you have anything abnormal out of that, you may have a fault scenario and those faults can not only impact your current in these ways, but could also impact your voltage. And the reason we have our switch gear there is to provide protection to that system and to reduce the loss on a network. So touching in a bit more detail on each of these types of faults. A short circuit, this can be caused if you have insulation failure. Now that might be between phases or between phase and earth. You might have a damaged cable. So you might have during construction, a digger accidentally cuts into your cable. You could have equipment that fails and causes a short circuit. You might simply have loose connections or water ingress into your board. You might have corrosion, or you might have human error that causes a short circuit, such as dropping a tool within a switchboard bus bar. Now, when you do have a short circuit, the consequence of that is this arcing current or arcing faults. And what that is, is that's when current jumps air gaps between phases where you've got a potential difference. And when it does that, you can have the risk of having fires or explosions within equipment rooms or the equipment itself. You can also have overheating. And as things overheat, your insulation of your cabling is damaged. So over time, that reduces the lifespan of your cabling and increases the chance of having another short circuit. Lastly, if you do have a short circuit, that could then cause issues in the operating voltages of your system. So a short circuit fault may then lead to a voltage rise or a voltage dip. So in this picture up here, what we're showing is a short circuit fault might be between all three phases, so our R, Y and B, or it might just be between two phases or it could be between three phases and Earth. So there's lots of combinations of faults that you might see. If we talk about overcurrent or overload, this is where a current draws in excess of the capacity of that power network. So it's overloaded. Now, in the short duration, this overload could be caused by inrush currents from a motor starting or a transformer energizing. In the longer duration, we might get an overload simply as a result of having too much load connected on one circuit. That could be lots of people connecting power boards to their general purpose outlets. It could be lots of lights turning on all at once. Use of double adapters is a very common issue in residential installations where you overload a circuit because you've plugged in too many adapters. You could have a cable that's undersized for the load that you expect to see or you might even have harmonics on your neutral cable. All of these can cause an overload. The third type of fault that we're looking at today is over voltage. So as the name implies, your voltage is rising above allowable limits, or you might have steady state over voltage. So for an example, in Australia, our voltage is allowed to fluctuate between 10% over and 6% under specified limits. Anything outside of that, we consider an over-voltage fault. The reason for that is all equipment connected to that voltage are able to withstand this range of voltage, but outside of that, they might be damaged. Now, an over-voltage can occur when suddenly your load changes a lot, or if your transformer has incorrect tap settings, so it's not putting out the correct voltage level. Similarly, with all types of faults, over voltage can cause insulation failure. So it puts extra stress on the insulation of your cables. As we know, if we stress the insulation of our cable and then it fails, we then have a short circuit scenario. Over voltage can also cause equipment failure. It can cause overheating and all in all reduces the operational life of your equipment. Now a voltage spike has very similar consequences, but different causes than an under or an over voltage scenario. So your voltage spike might be caused by lightning or might be caused by a lot of switching. It still impacts your insulation, which can cause a short circuit down the line. It can still cause your equipment to failure if it's not able to handle or is very sensitive to the quality of your voltage. So it can cause fire. 
So in this graph here, you can see our voltage waveform is impacted by these spikes as it's not a clean sine wave. Now, cabling and equipment is specified with what's known as a BIL, and this is your basic insulation level. And that's the ability of that particular component to withstand short-term overvoltage. Now, it's just a little note here to say that your BIL is based on your peak voltage and not your RMS. Okay, so let's look at circuit breakers themselves. So what we've got here is just a side view of a circuit breaker, a miniature circuit breaker open so that we can talk through each of the components that make up this protective device. So over here we have our actuator lever. So this is where you would turn your circuit breaker on and on manually. For number two, we have the actuator mechanism. Now this is what forces those contacts together or apart, which opens or closes your breaker. The third part is the contacts themselves. So this is allowing current when they touch and it breaks the current when they're moved apart. Number four down here is our terminals where we can put inputs in and out to monitor the status of a breaker. Number five is our biometallic strip. So this is what causes those contacts to open or close in relation to what the current is. This screw here is known as the calibration screw and it allows the manufacturer, not anyone else, to adjust the trip current of the device once it's assembled. Now number seven is a primary component of a breaker and this is our solenoid. This is what, when current flows through it, separates those contacts when you have rapidly rising higher currents than expected. And number eight, this is the second most important component. This is your arc divider or extinguisher. So as your contacts pull apart and you have an, often have an arc forming between those because of the force, this is what extinguishes that arc and makes it safe. So how do circuit breakers actually operate? Whether they're miniature circuit breakers, molded case circuit breakers, or air circuit breakers, they all operate similarly. They detect a fault, and then they often use thermal and magnetic components to open during that fault. So sometimes more in HV than LV, we use relays for early detection, and that's because relays are a lot, um, they can read faults a lot more quickly. Now the tripping mechanism of a circuit breaker uses mechanically stored energy. And this is either solenoids or part of the fault current, current. And the reason for that is when you have a fault, you're able to open or close without power being available. So if we look at how they operate, when a current is interrupted, you have that arc generating. And that's because your contacts are trying to pull apart when there's a big voltage potential between those two. Now that arc has to be controlled somehow. It has to be cooled, it has to be extinguished so that the gap between the contacts can again withstand the voltage in the circuit. Now different circuit breakers use different mediums to quench that arc. It might be a vacuum, it might be air, it might be insulated gas, or it might be oil as the medium in which the arc forms in. There is still a few different techniques for extinguishing the arc. You could lengthen or deflect it, you could cool it, or you could divide it into little arcs. The whole concept is you're trying to reduce the amount of energy in that arc until it's no longer a risk. Now, zero point quenching, this is another way to operate a circuit breaker, and it's where your contacts open at your zero current time crossing on your AC waveform. So it means you're effectively breaking it when there's no load current at the time of opening. As we know from a sine wave, the zero crossing occurs twice um, the line frequency, meaning 100 times per second for a 50 hertz network. Lastly, once the fault has been cleared, your contacts need to be able to close again to restore power to your interrupted, break, interrupted circuits. So the key takeaway from this is 
unlike fuses, circuit breakers can be reset multiple times. Fuses, however, as they're sacrificial, mostly cannot. So when we're looking at circuit breakers operating in a fault, obviously the breaker itself must be able to withstand the load current. There's no point having a circuit breaker that will melt or explode under its expected fault current. Now co the contacts of your breaker, these are typically made of copper or copper alloys, silver alloys, or anything that is really highly conductive because you're wanting to be able to open and close those contacts. Now your miniature and your molded case breakers, so your MCBs and your MCCBs, these are usually discarded when your contacts are worn. So if you ever see a circuit breaker that are described as pitted and they look corroded, it means they've opened and closed a lot or tripped a lot and they may need to be replaced. In your bigger breakers, you're able to replace just these components without having to replace the entire part. So they've got replaceable contacts. So now we're going to go back to how we quench an arc. And a very quick poll question is, what mediums have you heard of, and I've given a few away, to quench arcs? Stay with me for one moment. If you have a look on this lecture, you should be able to now submit your answers. Looks to be pretty even between air, oil and gas. All right, I'm going to stop that there. Air takes the winner, followed closely by the other two. Now the answer is all of them. So you're all correct. So as we mentioned, for circuit breakers, there's different interruption techniques for arcs. The most common is air, as most of you selected. Now, this is where you use air and you split the arc into smaller and smaller arcs until it's simply cooled down enough. You can also deflect it into arc shoots, or you might use magnetic blowout coils or permanent magnets. Another way of being done to use air is using compressed air. So this is where, where the arc is formed. Compressed air is blown onto the arc at a high pressure to fully extinguish it more quickly. In medium high voltage, it is more common to have oil as an arc interruption technique. And this is where you rely on vaporization of some of that oil to blast a jet of oil through the arc. So still on tripping mechanisms for circuit breakers, there's two types of trip that we'll look at. I've mentioned there's the long time trip and then there's the short time trip. So in the long time, the tripping mechanism is a thermal trip. So it's to do with heat. So this is where it uses your solenoid whose pulling forces increase with your current because it's proportional. So certain designs utilize electromagnetic forces in addition to those of the solenoid, but essentially the circuit breaker contacts are held together by a latch. And as your current in your solenoid increases beyond the rating of that circuit breaker, so call it 20 amps, your solenoid's pull releases that latch. And that's what lets the contacts open by a spring, so that mechanical force. Some magnetic breakers incorporate a hydraulic time delay feature, and all this is is where you've got a very viscous material that adds a bit of time delay between when that latch undoes and when those contacts open. And that delay is dependent on how restrictive that fluid is. If we're talking, oh, here's a graph. So thermal tripping time, this is your classic time and current tripping curve. So this line here, this line here represents the operation of your circuit breaker. So in the long time, so up towards the top of this graph, this is the thermal release of your circuit breaker. If we were to look at a very short time, the circuit breaker trips based on magnetic release. 
So what we mean by that is it's an electromagnetic release and that occurs during an instantaneous fault because your time is very, very small. Now, it's very common to have this in, circuit, in distribution boards and your electromagnetic responds to those instantaneous currents we were just talking about. And your biometallic strip responds to overcurrent, overcurrents. So for your thermal tripping, we're looking at your biometallic strip as being the tripping component. In your electromagnetic tripping portion of your curve, we're talking about an electromagnetic electromagnet that causes the trip. So now we're moving a bit more into fuses and miniature circuit breakers. So a common question is why fuses blow unexpectedly? So for example, a 30 amp fuse may trip one day when it's carrying 30 amps. And this is, there is a small likelihood that this can happen. What this would indicate is if your fuse has had a lot of overloads before, which you may or may not have even noticed in your installation, it makes it more likely to be more sensitive and to trip later in the, or in the future. So often when a trip, a fuse seems to have blown for no reason at all, it's probably been exposed to a lot of overloads up until that point. So if a fuse is marked as 30 amps, it could actually stand 40 amps over an hour. So how do we justify calling it a 30 amp fuse? Another very common question. And the answer is that your thermal overload characteristics of your fuses and your breakers are designed to match the properties of the cable. So there is flux in what those ratings are. So for example, a PVC cable could withstand 50% overload for an hour. So we would need to make sure that our fuse can withstand that as well. Otherwise it would be tripping out before your cable needed protection. So looking at this graph, what we have here in red is a 32 amp uh, miniature circuit breaker. And this is the tripping characteristic of that breaker. We also have a 30 amp fuse in this blue dashed line. So the question is, if we wanted to make sure that our devices would trip in 0.1 seconds, which is half a cycle, what current do we need at each device? So if we look at the red line first, which is our tripping characteristics of our breaker, if we want it to operate in 0.1 seconds, we need to have a current of 128 amps because this is where those two lines intersect. However, if we want our fuse to trip at 0.1 second, if we come across to here, we need 300 amps before that fuse would trip. So it's clear that the fuse needs a lot more current to blow in that time than the breaker. However, if you look at their nameplate ratings, one is 32 and one is 30 amps. So it's important to look at these in detail. So let's do another quick question. Looking at this graph, which will trip first? at a thousand seconds. Will it be the miniature circuit breaker or will it be the fuse? Let me know what you think. And we're looking at a thousand seconds on this graph. Looking pretty neck and neck. All right, I'm going to stop you there. Almost just more of you said the fuse and the answer is we don't know. Another trick question. Now the answer is if we look at this graph at a thousand seconds, at this point, both of the devices will trip at the same current. So because at this point, the graphs overlap, if we were to walking down here at point one, your fuse would trip later, sorry, it would require a higher current than your breaker, but up here would be the same current.
Okay, now let's touch on some circuit breaker ratings. So there's a lot of text on this slide, but essentially what I'm describing here is that for each type of breaker, there are preset typical values. So for your miniature breakers, which are your small breakers, they go up from 6, 10, 16, 20, 25, etc., up to about 63. Then we start looking at your MCCBs, which are your molded case breakers. Although they start as low as 25, they can go up to about 3200 amps. Your air circuit breakers, they start only around 200, but they go above 3200 amps. Now the difference between these is not only how much they're rated for in amps, but some of them have a fixed setting and some of them have adjustable trip settings. Now your smaller breakers tend to be fixed, while your bigger breakers you tend to have a lot of flexibility with those current time graphs. And that's so that you can tune it to protect your equipment exactly how you need it to. So the example circuit breaker with a 400 amp frame size might have its overcurrent detection set to operate at 300 to protect a particular feeder cable. Now things to consider when you are selecting a circuit breaker. The first one is, what type do you want? Do you want miniature, molded, air, or do you even want RCD protection, which we'll talk on in a second? There are some preset curves known as B, C, and D. And this is where you, although it's fixed, can pick the type of curve that you want, mainly in your miniature breakers. You might want to size how big your frame is and also what you want it to trip at. You've got some customization with further settings, so what fault levels you want or my IP rating. You might have specific tripping breakers for DOL, VSD or soft starting motors. So if you've got motors with very high inrush currents, you'll make sure you've got a circuit breaker that isn't sense enough to trip every time that motor starts up. You would then do a discrimination study to coordinate all of your protective devices. You might even look at selectivity or cascading, which is to do with how much current they can withstand within a fault current scenario. And you might also add some accessories to your breakers. There's motorized breakers, there's under voltage trips, there's earth fault detection. So it really comes down to what your device needs to protect. So here are some more graphs. So I mentioned in the miniature circuit, brain, uh, miniature circuit breaker range, you can get preset curve types. So you can have type B, D, C, K, etc. Now they've got different ratings. So a type B could handle three to five times its load current. So what we mean by that is if it was a 20 amp type B circuit breaker, it could handle 60 to maths 20 times five <laughs> the load of that circuit breaker. Also, because of that, if you compare B, C and D, you can see that this section here of your graph is changing. So that magnetic instantaneous trip portion of your current is different depending if you get a B, a C or a D. So for example, if you have a motor, you might want that instantaneous to only happen at very, very high currents because you expect to see a very big current when that motor starts. Over here, if we look at this green and red chart, it shows that this bit here is your tripping zone. Before that, your breaker will not trip, but after that, your breaker will trip instantaneously. Now, if you've got what's known as an electronic breaker, you're able to fully customize your trip curve however you want. So every one of these colored sections could be a customized setting that you can input on your breaker. So you could move your uh, long time tripping forward and back, you can move it up and down, and you can use that to grade various devices up and downstream from your network. So let's go through in a bit more detail the different types of breakers. So miniature circuit breakers. These are very fast and they're often thermomagnetic like we spoke about earlier. They're typically up to 100 amps. They can handle fault currents, but not crazy huge fault currents, so up to about 15 kA. They're typically not an adjustable circuit breaker in terms of its settings. 
You could have straight thermal or more commonly you tend to have thermal magnetic. You can obviously get single pole or three phase or double pole depending on what you need. And this is typically what you see in your distribution boards that services your general power and lighting. They're also very cheap. If we're talking about your molded case circuit breakers, these tend to be bigger, higher handle, can handle higher currents and can handle higher fault levels. You can often get electronic versions where you can do that customization of the tripping curve like this. That's being funny. Um, you can still get thermal and thermomagnetic versions. You can obviously get single, double or three pole versions. Now they're generally used when you've got higher loads and a higher fault level. You can remotely operate them, so getting those extra accessories to have remote operation. Obviously, they are more expensive though than your miniature types. Now lastly, if we're going up in price, up in current withstand capacity and up in fault withstand capacities, we end up with our air circuit breakers. Now, these ones are rated up to 10,000 amps, and that's normal operation, that's not fault levels. They can handle up to 80 kA of fault levels though. They're fully adjustable trip settings. You can have time delays, you can integrate them with relays. They're typically all electronically controlled, meaning no thermal or magnetic components. And they're used in your large power loads, your large installations, and they are the most expensive. You can get them where they're fixed within a switchboard or you can get draw out versions so that, as you can see here on this handle, you can quickly unwind the breaker and replace it to reduce your downtime. So last one that we're just going to touch on briefly, what we have over here is a combined miniature circuit breaker and residual current device. So it's called an RCBO, residual current with overload protection. So it's a combination of an RCD with a miniature circuit breaker. Now, what an RCD does is it simply looks at if, if you've got an imbalance between your neutral and your phase. Because if you do have that, it means you're losing some current on your earth. So you must have an earth fault of some sort. So any leakage, even if it's very small, is dangerous. For that reason, RCDs are typically required on most residential installations or anywhere where you can expose people to power. Now, RCDs are typically rated at 30 milliamps. And the reason for that is 30 milliamps or 0.03 amperes. This is the value that's found to cause cardiac arrest or serious harm if it runs through a human body. So if, it's, if 30 milliamps or more is detected, this circuit breaker will trip. So here is just the schematic of showing what that looks like. So we have a sensing coil over here that's comparing your neutral with your line. If it finds that there is a discrepancy between those two, it means you are losing, uh, you're losing a current through your earth fault or through your earth cabling. And so that breaker will trip. And it will open here and cut power to both your line and your neutral. So as I mentioned, in Australia, RCDs are mandatory and have been for many years, uh, especially in domestic installations or anywhere that you have general power and lighting. Now, lastly, I just wanted to show a quick example of what I mean by discrimination. So discrimination is where we coordinate those trip curves between de protective devices, and that might be from breaker to breaker or breaker to fuse or a combination. So on this drawing here, what you can see is we have a circuit breaker at our incoming switchboard, we have a circuit breaker going out, and then we have circuit breakers coming off of our second switchboard. So these three devices, as an example, we would need to coordinate together in what's known as a coordination study. So as a very simple example, if you had a 63 amp breaker with a 40 amp breaker, and these were thermal miniature circuit breakers, the curves might look something like this. So at this particular current, your 40 amp would trip before your 63 amp. 
And that's what you want in this order because you would want, if there was a fault down here, your 40 amp breaker to trip before your 63 amp breaker. Now, this is a simple example. This is a more complex example. So here you can see we have one, two, three, four, five devices that are coordinated from your incoming supply all the way down to your final miniature circuit breaker. As you can see, they're all different shapes. So a lot of these, such as this one, would be electronic where we've managed to change those settings to fit in between our two other curves. And that's what's known as a discrimination study. You can do the same thing for fuses. So here we have a fuse initially because often it's associated with the HV infrastructure. And here we've got a couple of circuit breakers. So just important comment is well, although we're showing these as single lines, the characteristics are actually within a range. So these lines represent the average. So realistically, imagine that they should be a little bit wider. So let's do a little bit of information on fuses um, so that we can cover both protective devices. So generally there's two types, which we mentioned at the very beginning. You can get a rewirable, difficult word, rewirable or a HRC fuse. So generally rewirable fuses are not used today. Uh, they can be unsafe to do. They also rely on who is doing the rewiring. Um, but in general, for a fuse, in normal conditions, your current will flow through that fuse element until such point that there is enough energy, meaning a high enough current, to melt that element. And that's when your circuit's broken. Now that element is often placed, if you look here, inside something that contains, this could be sand. And so when that element melts, the sand absorbs that extra heat to not cause a fire. If you have a very large current, as you can see here, you can see that element breaking. Now, how long it takes for that to break is what's known as your arcing time. Now, HRC fuses, in here you can see that we've got a fault current up to this point here, and then it arcs as it closes, or sorry, as that element melts and it opens. So it's just showing you that it takes a certain amount of time for the fault current to be high enough to melt that component and then be quenched. Now the pre-arcing time, which is this point shown as A, is the time take given by your fuse characteristic. So essentially this all in all, total C is how long it takes for your fault current to break your element. Now, this is just a graph that shows all different types of fuses that you might get. So that pre-arcing time we shown about A is here. And you can select from various types of fuses to suit your installation. Because remember, a fuse isn't electronic. You can't change the graph of a fuse. It's fixed. So the final question that I have for you before we wrap up is on the conversation of derating. So if you install a miniature circuit breaker or a fuse in a hotter environment, would you expect this device to trip more quickly? Or would you expect it to trip slower? I'll just set this poll up for you. Let me know your thoughts. When I say hotter, I'm talking higher than ambient. We have a resounding answer of quicker. Yes, you are all correct. Switch gear or protective devices installed in a hotter environment needs to be derated because the switch gear because of higher currents causing more heat, will think that it has a higher current than it actually does. 
So what you need to do is if you're ever installing fuses or miniature circuit breakers into an area that has higher than ambient, which is typically 40 degrees, you need to derate that fuse for that temperature. And there's graphs available for that. So what I've got on this slide is an excerpt from a typical fuse supplier. And what they say is if you want a 20 amp fuse, it's rated for, if we look at this example, all the way up to 70 degrees. However, if you want to install it in a 75 degree ambient, a 20 amp fuse is only rated to 18. The bigger the fuse, the more noticeable the derating. So a 400 amp fuse in a 60 degree environment is only rated to 380. So it's just something to keep in mind. And the same goes for your thermal magnetic miniature circuit breakers because they are heavily impacted by thermal energy. So again, if we take the example of a 100 amp breaker, if you install that in 40 degrees, perfect, it's rated for 100 amps. If you put it in a hotter environment, its rating goes down. So in 70 degrees, it's only rated to 85 amps. However, the opposite is also true. If you put it in a very cold environment, say 10 degrees, its rating then goes up to 115. Meaning if you have 100 amps of load, but it's in a 10 degree environment, your circuit breaker will not trip. So that's just something to keep in mind. So that brings us to the end of the presentation. Uh, I hope by listening in, you've got a bit more of an understanding of projective devices, specifically our fuses and our circuit breakers. We talked through a couple of different types of faults. So whether it's a short time or a long time fault, which would indicate a short circuit or an overload, as well as under or over voltage. The things to take away is that all devices operate similarly, especially circuit breakers. You essentially, you detect a fault, you have a tripping, tripping mechanism, and then you quench the arc and be able to close back onto your circuit. Circuit breakers can be reset. They can be reused up to a point. Fuses are very are sacrificial. They can't be reused, so they're single use. So when you are selecting your devices, just remember that you need to do a discrimination study and coordinate those devices up and downstream. And lastly, be cautious of where you're installing them. If you have a high or a low temperature area, make sure that you've accounted for that when you're selecting your circuit breaker or fuse and its rating. And that's it from me. Thanks very much, Alex. Um, I will just reshare my slides. That was a, that was a great, um, Great presentation, by the way. Um, just select my slide. Okay. All right. Thanks again, Alex, and um, uh, everyone in the session. Um, thanks for all your comments coming through. Um, I'm sure Alex really appreciates that. Um, these are our upcoming uh, technical webinars. So um, we run these about once a week or once every two weeks now. Um, these are our upcoming ones. So we've got a few over the next few weeks. Um, however, I do have a lot more scheduled. So even though there's only three on the slide there, I've got a lot more um, that are almost ready to be put on the website so just check our events page regularly um, and all of our free webinars will be posted up there um, and yeah every, and about uh, if anyone's interested in webinars other than the ones on the screen um, I'm planning on putting some more up there um, next week so check yeah just check that events page regularly but um, we've got a couple of civil engineering webinars coming up as you can see on the screen. And then we also have a um, uh, industrial automation webinar you might be interested in on the uh, 16th of June there on the screen. Um, and you can view and register for those on the events page. And these are our upcoming courses. So as I mentioned at the start of the webinar, um, we have a range of different course types. Uh, we only specialize in engineering courses. And um, 
I just like to run through this slide to give you an idea of how our courses are scheduled or structured. So our short courses, the three month short courses, they run throughout the year. So every single um, professional certificate has different intakes um, and has a different uh, frequency of intakes. Um, some professional certificates only have one intake a year. Um, some have three or four, depending on popularity. Um, we have diplomas and advanced diplomas, and the same thing, they all have different intakes um, and different frequency. Um, our undergraduate certificates and bachelor's degrees, as well as our Doctor of Engineering, is starting on the 25th of July. Um, we have graduate certificates and master's degrees starting at the end of this month on the 27th of June. We also have on-campus courses, um, so our bachelor's, master's and doctorate. Um, so they're starting on the 1st of August. Um, and you can also go to our schedule page uh, on our website. I always recommend going to the schedule page because you can see all of our courses and intakes uh, sorted by date. Um, in a very, very quick uh, table um, if you're interested in um, applying for one of our courses. Okay, um, so we're almost at the end of the presentation, but um, as I said, uh, if you'd like to, um, if you'd like to request a certificate for this session, you can do so by um, by scanning the QR code on the screen there. I'll also put the link in the chat box there for you. Hopefully that link works. Yeah, so um, yes, yeah, so either scan the QR code if you've got your smartphone there um, with your camera or um, just um, just click the link that I've put in the chat box there. So that will take you to a short form that you need to fill out if you would like to receive a certificate for um, this session. Okay, I'll just um, leave that slide up for a few more seconds. Sorry guys, uh, that link um, doesn't appear to work. That's okay. Just give me one moment. And just try that one. I think that should work. Sorry about that. Um, so that, that link there works, but otherwise just scan the QR code um, on the screen. So that link that link there will work. Sorry about that again. Um, okay, and uh, once you've filled out the form, um, I will send a certificate to you sometime tomorrow. So uh, please be patient. Um, and that's pretty much the end of the, uh, the end of the webinar. Um, I'll just skip to the last slide uh, just for our contact details, but we'll just run a short um, Q&A session now. So um, if anyone does have any questions for us, um, that would be great. Uh, please put them in the chat box. Um, but uh, yeah, otherwise, if you need to go, thank you very much for attending today's webinar. But otherwise, please um, please put your questions in the chat box and we'll try and answer them for you while we're live. Okay, um, there's a few people asking about the the slides and the video recording. So, um, as I mentioned earlier, um, as I mentioned earlier, the uh, slides and the video recording will be sent to you via email automatically tomorrow. So, everyone registered for this webinar will receive the PDF slides and the video recording. If you would like a certificate of attendance, you need to fill the form out uh, via the link I've just posted again in the chat box. Okay. Um, okay, I think the first question that came through was for you, Alex. The one was from Muhammad. Um, other than temperature, what other factors can affect breaker uh, performance and why electrical contacts always prefer to have tin or silver plating? Mm. 
Uh, so tin and silver are just very good conductors. So you want your contactors to be very good at conduct conducting current. Um, as to what else impacts other than temperature, it's same as your normal ambient temperature, sorry, um, yeah, ambient conditions. So uh, temperature is one, humidity is another, whether it's very moist or very dry, even uh, your altitude. So most things are designed for a thousand meters above um, uh, water level, anything higher than that, and you need to then consider how that affects the operation of your switch gear. Um, so, but temperature is in this lecture because it's one of uh, the most common and has one of the biggest impacts. Thanks, Alex. Um, uh, there's a question for me. So that one uh, is from, uh, sorry, from my pronunciation, Ebenezer. Um, the fee for the diploma and degree in electrical engineering and also fee for a certificate. Okay, so um, so our uh, our fees at EIT are, are, are region based and we have different we work with different currencies as well. So the best um, the best way to look at our fees is go to the fees page. Um, if you go to webs our website um, under the how to apply drop down menu there is a fees page and on that page you need to um, you need to input uh, your your country of residence and then that will show you the relevant fees for your country um, and the fee for the certificate so if you're referring to the certificate for this webinar um, that is free so there's no charge for that uh, certificate um, I'll just post a link for the certificate in the chat box again. Um, but yep, the uh, professional certificate courses. Yep, so the same thing. Um, uh, our um, our professional certificate courses on that fees page. If you in, if you enter your country of residence on the fees page, um, the fees will display at EIT. So all of our um, uh, all of our course types, it'll show you everything there, um, which is convenient. Um, what was the next question? Um, I tried to answer most of them, I think, that were technical questions. Uh, I think there was one here from Adani, um, GPOs, so that's general purpose outlets, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Um, to power points. Yes. Um, just scanning through the comments. Thanks for the comments, everyone. Um, and uh, Latvia, uh, we will. Um, this session is re recorded, and will uh, you'll receive that via email with the slides tomorrow. Uh, Jawad, we have um, we have many electrical engineering courses. Um, so, uh, yeah, ranging from our short courses um, to our diplomas and advanced diplomas to uh, bachelors, masters, and um, can even do a research topic in um, electrical for our doctor of engineering program. So, um, our four main um, schools of engineering at EIT are electrical, civil mechanical and industrial automation engineering. So you'd find that most of our courses fall under one of those fields um, and we have and we have many courses um, across all of our course types. Listen, um, thanks for thanks for the comment. Um, the best way to uh, to find um, the fees would be to go to the fees page and for the duration um, just go to the relevant course page but if you would like to speak to someone about um, our courses please go to the contact us page and um, reach out to one of our course advisors and they'll be more than happy to help you. Um, I think there's a technical question here Alex. Uh, Karina's asked uh, what software can we use to coordinate uh, protection? Yeah, um, so there's a fair few that's available. Uh, I know EIT itself hosts. Um, Sorry, I just see your comment. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. There's about a half dozen in the remote labs for those courses through EIT. But 
Um, ETAP is a common one if you've heard of that, um, or PowerCAD is the most common for LV. Um, so there's a whole there's a whole range around, and most power system modules have sorry power system software have modules for cable selection and circuit protection or discrimination studies. Thank you. Um, there's also a question here. Do you accept international students for face-to-face -face class on your campus? Yes. Um, so um, for our on-campus courses, we 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 facilitate face-to-face -face classes, um, and yeah, we our on-campus courses are are available to international students. If you'd like to speak about uh, speak to one of our course advisors about those on-campus courses, feel free to contact us. That's our bachelor's and master's degrees that are delivered on campus. Um, and we have two campuses in Australia, in Perth and in Melbourne. Emmanuel, um, so uh, telecommunications engineering, um, we don't offer a PhD program, but we do offer a doctor of engineering program. They do have similarities, but they are different. Um, qualifications um, I believe we I believe we um, accept topics in telecommunications but don't quote me on that um, I would recommend reaching out to one of our course advisors uh, to see uh, what um, what areas we cover but there's quite a few areas um, that we can cover in the doctor of engineering program uh, and yes Goulet we have a master of engineering degree in um, in electrical. Um, I'll just post that link again in case that's gotten lost for the certificate of attendance. Um, okay, I think we've just got a few more technical questions. I think um, another one from Ad Adani, uh, the basic insulation level for cable. So this is a rating that you would see on a cable data sheet. Um, and so essentially it's just showing how durable the insulation of that particular cable is. Um, it ties into what its temperature rating is. So you might have cabling for 70 degrees, for 90 degrees. Um, and so you can look at that and compare that in a Ka, so a kilo amps value, to what you think your uh, fault levels are on your system to make sure that it's suitable. Thanks, Alex. Um, innocent, um, yes, some of our degrees and diplomas are internationally recognised. However, not all of them are. You would need to check our accreditation page or the course page of the specific course type um, and just check the accreditation details there. But we have we have quite a few um, degrees and um, and advanced diplomas now that are internationally accredited. So that's a it's a good thing. Um, it's quite a technical question from um, Ian. Uh, what is the difference between the ultimate braking capacity and service braking capacity of an MCCB? I'm not sure about that. Ultimate versus service. Um, it could be that if you're expecting higher levels in normal operation, um, but I thought that would tie into what that circuit breaker was normally rated for. So for example, a 20 amp breaker, like we said, in normal service can withstand up to four times that rating without operating, whereas you've got your fault protection, which is um, during a fault scenario that's much higher. So a 20 amp breaker in a fault scenario might withstand up to 15,000 amps. Uh, so that's my interpretation of those two. It might be different terminology between the different countries, um, but that would be what I guess. Awesome. Um, okay, I think I think we've gotten through a few questions there. Um, unfortunately, we don't have much time left, so I think we'll wrap it up. Um, uh, but if anyone does have any further questions, um, please please send um, send me an email if you'd like. Uh, my email is on the screen there. So uh, webinars at eit.edu.au. So if your question didn't get answered um, or you would like to send me an email for something else, just um, just please send me an email. 
um, and I will I will reply to it or I'll forward it on to the to the relevant person. Um, Jeffrey, yes, uh, all of our courses are offered online. However, we do um, offer our ma uh, bachelor's and master's degrees uh, well, and our doctor of engineering on campus in Australia as well as, as an option, but we mainly operate online. So all of our courses are done online. Okay. Um, look, thanks, thanks again, uh, Alex, for presenting and thanks to everyone that's um, attended the webinar today. We really appreciate it. Um, yeah, as I said, please contact us. All of our details are on the screen, and uh, we hope to see you again in the future. Maybe in a maybe in another webinar, or um, or maybe in one of our courses. So um, thank you very much, and um, have a good day wherever you are. Thanks, everybody.